First of all, I just want to take a moment to thank our hosts and curators. Um, uh, part of what I'm going to talk about today is a little bit of history. <clears throat> and so I think that the uh, often the roots of ideas and the seeds of ideas come from unexpected places. And I'd like to exp express the first uh, word of deep gratitude to Denise for cooking two amazing humans uh, that have catalyzed this amazing gathering. So if the roads lead, all roads lead back to Denise. And for that, I'd like to also thank Matthew and Brian, Rebecca, uh, the entire group of you who have curated this really powerful gathering of people. It is truly diverse, and it's diverse because it's diverse in terms of opinions. It's diverse in terms of professional backgrounds. I think there are a lot of meshing cultures here, and compliments to the chefs who, who were bold enough to bring the, these ideas and people together. Um, and thanks also yesterday for the really powerful theme of open hearts and open minds and repeating that refrain. And I think a lot of people heard it and felt it, which is really good. I was talking to someone yesterday who was talking about how even working in a space such as a geodesic dome changes the energy around which uh, these kinds of gatherings take place. It's much more reflective and there's a lot more energy that's catalyzed. So um, what I'd like to offer in my 17 minutes and 55 seconds is a, uh, a, a challenge that we all work together toward creating a new story around digital media. It was really interesting hearing the backgrounds and I'm really looking forward to hearing the talks of the people who are going to be coming throughout the day who are doing innovation through digital media. But we are, in, in as much as we were talking yesterday about a re going through a period of revolution in agriculture technology, we're also in the middle of another revolution in uh, digital media. Um, and I'll tell you a little bit about the history of why why uh, I think we're at the at sort of the, the peak point of, of that moment of transfer transformation and why it's an opportunity. Uh, but first, I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about uh, my history. And so I'm, a, I'm trained as, a, an, as an anthropologist. And so the filter through which, how in, through which I come to uh, and engage um, uh, moments is through uh, cultural uh, sensitivity, taking a culture on its own terms. I was raised uh, by a uh, husband and wife team of uh, chimpanzee sign language researchers. They raised a family of five chimpanzees as though they were deaf human children. And this was during, uh, and this is very relevant to, to cultural uh, communication. In fact, I, my parents, I say my parents are into interspecies communication and I'm into intercultural, intraspecies communication. But um, one of the reasons that they chose sign language is because they needed to take this uh, species on its own terms. The first, uh, the, the arrogance of humanity is often that we think we can dictate the terms of the culture. And listening to the story about uh, yesterday that we heard about um, the, the early agricultural, how, how the, the, the Brits were coming to, uh, to New Zealand and they viewed the forest as a threat and so they cut it all down. Instead, so much of the refrain we've been talking about is how do we take nature on its own terms? Well, I think we also need to make sure that we take human cultures on its, on its own terms and, and other uh, species cultures. So a brief snapshot on, chi on chimpanzee uh, uh, interspecies communication. The earliest uh, research was done in the 1950s. Uh, there was a family that raised a chimpanzee named Vicky. Uh, and this was when, and through the arrogance of humanity, we thought, well, clearly chimpanzees have a capacity for speech. Let's just teach them how to talk like humans. Well, chimpanzees don't have the capacity for uh, voluntary vocalizations, and it's entirely limbically driven. So for instance, if I dropped a, a glass on my foot right now, I wouldn't look down at my foot and say, oh, that hurts. I'd say, ow! That's the limbic. So if you're in the wild, it's highly adaptive for chimps. Chimps have a food bark. When one chimp is on the other side of the jungle and they hear the, oh, 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 that everyone else hears it and they come gather to food. That's highly adaptive for that kind of survival. Um, but humans have, having a frontal lobe and having de uh, developed uh, the capacity for vocal speech, we, we have other adaptive traits. So in our arrogance, we tried to teach Vicky uh, uh, um, vocal English. She was capable of four words with a very thick chimp accent, which were mama, papa, cup, and up. And if you can imagine, if you don't have control, voluntary control of your larynx, what that might, might sound like, it was So what I learned from, so my parents ended up raising chimps they, we, the reason that we, that, that, that the other, other notion that they uh, learned was that um, humans, or, or at least uh, active information-seeking organisms, the reason that we all 
learned the languages that we spoke is because we were born into this family of these people and we wanted to be able to communicate with them. And we had these big, wide, cute faces and they wanted to be able to communicate with us. And so we learned their language. So what they did with Washo, the first chimpanzee, is they immer to, to be taught sign language, is they immersed her in a community of friends and signed around her, and lo, she learned sign language. So the lesson from that was, take a, uh, was to take a culture and a species on its own terms when you're thinking about how to engage it. And that metaphor and that, and that thesis applies toward media as well. Um, so uh, I got my first uh, epiphanic moment in digital media was in 1990. I was uh, at the University of Washington, and I had my first experience, this was, uh, this was before, we have to think about where we were in 1990. It wasn't so long ago, but we had no web browsers. We had no graphical user interface. The internet was actually just used for text. So there, were, there was IRC chat, which, was, which is still alive, but was a text base. And I logged on to an IRC chat that a friend of mine showed me in a, in a lab at, at the University of Washington. And uh, I immediately started texting with... Um, uh, some Israeli graduate students at Haifa while scud bombs were landing in Israel. And I had this moment where I said, wow, this is going to radically change the way that we're all going to communicate and understand each other as cultures. And I committed myself to, to being a part of that. I went on from there to work at the U.S. State Department uh, where I was for uh, six years. I was actually at our media outreach division. It was an organization that uh, in the infinite wisdom of the U.S. government, we closed in 1999. Uh, it was sort of effectively our ministry of culture. Uh, it had built tens of thousands of libraries around the world. It funded exchange programs. Uh, it had a big radio station called the Voice of America, and I was based there uh, for a majority of the time that I was there. But the uh, what we tried to do with the, at, the, at the Voice of America was to tell stories in a way that were relevant to the communities that wanted to receive them. And that means what technology are they are they using? One of the things that you'll see in, in uh, or that I've seen in communities in which information is con heavily controlled by government is that people will go to any means necessary to access that information. And we're seeing new arcs of that today, even in terms of freeing information. And um, so one, two of the projects that I worked on, one is we had the, we had these, we, had, we were broadcasting in 52 different languages and we put uh, radio booths into, or we put video cameras into radio booths, which was, this predates Howard Stern and Rush Limbaugh and all of the talk radio people who are now, who it's now become a ubiqu ubiquitous part of their practice. But our notion was, well, there are unused satellite times, uh, satellite transponders that Rupert Murdoch is, is using in Southeast Asia and China. Uh, what if we simply co-streamed our, our radio signal upon these video uh, uh, transponders and explained to people how to build, uh, how to, how to build satellite channels or how to, satellite dishes? And indeed, people in China and Iran ended up building satellite dishes out of garbage can lids to say, oh, I can hear you, and this whole relationship with, with visual and audio shifted and changed. So, um, and the other thing that we did was uh, worked with a guy named Rob Glazer, who was running a company at the time called Progressive Networks, which ultimately became one of the, for a period, one of the most offensive and aggressive media uh, entities, which is called Real Media. I'm sure many of you can remember the, the how Real, Real Media worked, uh, which was one of the early streaming things. But we actually were we streamed uh, the Voice of America in 52 different languages, and that was a another really interesting thing was that in. Again, we have to think about where we were in 1990, 91, where, where the internet was, it, we were, most everyone here in the United States was on dial-up, and if the United States was on dial-up, the rest of the world was on, world was on a worse dial-up or there. Or there. And, but if the, the notion was if you make the technology and the media accessible to people by the me, any means that they can possibly access it, they will, they will come to it. So I left, uh, in 1996, I left the State Department uh, because of another tectonic shift in media that was taking place. And that was uh, that a, a CBS gift store clerk named Matt Drudge had uh, discovered that the dailies that uh, The Hollywood Reporter and Variety um, uh, uh, pay thousands of dollars or charge thousands of dollars for people to access every every day. We're now we're being dumped every night every day in the dumpster outside of his of the gift store, and so he ended up taking those, scanning them, and putting them up on his website called the Drudge Report. Well, this ultimately uh, he he had connections in the in um, 
in conservative politics and people started leaking information and a very, very significant leak came out wh which was otherwise unheard of in the media sphere which is that um, Michael, Michael Isakoff, who was an investigative reporter for Newsweek was uh, reporting on a story about President Clinton ha uh, potentially having had a uh, liaison with one of his interns. Um, and this, so the fact that this information was leaking out of a, uh, a, a very closed newsroom onto the internet, onto now we have web browsers, 1990, 1991 was the birth of Mosaic, so one of the first web browsers came out then, and so we're still in the early days of, of, um, of sort of what the web meant in terms of the internet. And, uh, uh, that ultimately became, ultimately this became a, a sensation that shifted the course of both journalism and internet journalism. And so I moved to Los Angeles, at, to, went to the University of Southern California to launch a think tank on the future of internet journalism. And one of the first things that we did was launch a, a digital watchdog called the Online Journalism Review. And we were kind of scrappy and our goal was to get people around, uh, in the journalism space to pay attention to the fact that this was a new medium. And one of the things that we discovered was that a lot of the uh, old lessons around advertising and the and the the firewall that traditionally takes place in the journalistic space, where you have, where um, where the advertising and the business side never touches the editorial side, was already beginning to blur. Fast forward to today, and it's a it's a it's a it's a food fight. But um, but it was even at then what we we saw we uncovered some. Uh, some suspicious or some some uh, cloudy efforts that the New York Times was doing, where they were bridging, um, where they were they were um, doing some sort of uh, ad for ad for coverage stories. So I did that for about seven years, and then um, I uh, I got I. W was invited to launch another think tank, and this one on the future of intercul intercultural collaboration. Um, and the notion here was, this was 2003, and so the notion here was that in 1999, after the US government had decided that we'd won the war of popular public opinion, and we, dis we got rid of our Ministry of Culture, and we shut down the libraries around the world, we all know what happened three years later, September 11th happened, and it's much easier to, to uh, close a bureaucracy than it is to create a brand new one, and so, uh, there, there, and the other interesting thing was that intercultural collaboration in a policy framework is not something that universities are interested in studying uh, because, interestingly enough, in the uh, engineering division, you have no problem uh, with collaboration with the government. There are plenty of engineers who are interested in working on new types of missile technology. But in the communication and, coll and cultural collaboration space, collaborating with the government was, con was perceived as uh, being in cahoots with the devil. These are the people that are, were against uh, um, cultural collaboration. They're uh, into controlling it. And I was part of a, a movement to try to at least get uh, an interest in academia to try to shape the narrative uh, of government. And so I launched this think tank called the Center on Public Diplomacy, and we, I created the first ever master's degree in public diplomacy, and it was uh, ultimately resulted in, I, I can't say there was a statistical correlation, but, but after we launched our center, either the zeitgeist of public diplomacy blossomed into a thousand flowers, but ministries of culture around the world started opening up public diplomacy divisions. Uh, several other universities then subsequently created masters in public diplomacy. But I brought my technology and digital media th um, filter with me, and I had, uh, had another epiphany, and that was a friend of mine uh, who was one of the faculty members had uh, introduced me to um, 3D video games. Uh, so this is uh, one, of, and we're now sort of in a in a peak video game space. But one of the games was called Star Wars Galaxies. In 2003, the notion of having a 3D representative of yourself as an extension of yourself was completely um, anathema. Uh, it was it was considered to be um, uh, a waste of one's time. Um, a lot of uh, antisocial. And it's important in context to think about the history of our relationship with every new layer of digital media uh, or every new layer of media. Humans are highly suspicious of any form of media that mitigates our conversations. So in fact, even when Samuel Morse built the telegraph, it was called the tell-lie-graph. 
when the telephones were first introduced in the U.S. as a, as a way to help farmers communicate, the, the press decried this as, a, as something that was going to stop people from leaving their houses and always talking on the phone. And so every layer that we add, so then we add, so the internet's born, and of course, people, uh, Steve Case was famous for saying when he launched AOL that if, weren't, if it weren't for rainy days and lonely people, there would never would have been an AOL. So America Online is one of the first internet uh, service providers in the United States that was based on sort of largely a chat program. Um, but so virtual worlds and video games were again considered were another layer of digital media that were considered to be an affront on our capacity to be social together. And I wasn't going to, I, I saw something uh, much more different going on. I saw, in, here we are in 2005, a, uh, a post-September 11th uh, commu uh, culture in which the United States had basically exhausted all of the goodwill that the world had felt for us because of, the, um, because of, uh, of, of our invasion of Afghanistan and Iraq, um, and people didn't like the United States. Polls around the world were you, I mean, think of all. We, we, think of what two, 2005 was like, where people in the United States were pouring out French wine and refusing to buy French fries. I mean, it was it was it was crazy, and the rest of the world was uh, was, was equally cynical about us. One of the things. That, fast forward. One of the things that came out of the, this effort to look at how th how 3D virtual worlds, uh, 3D games, and virtual worlds were were. Um, were uh, changing the landscape as I ended up getting a $1.5 million grant from the MacArthur Foundation to look at how virtual worlds could change the face of philanthropy. And what was, and basically this was based on a, psycho, uh, a premise in, in neuroscience and neuropsychology, which is that because we, are, we have stereoscopic vision, humans remember 3D visual experiences differently than we remember audio or text-only experiences. We're hardwired to remember these kinds of experiences as real. So there are, if you will, folders in our brains that if I see an avatar of Nina on a screen, I'm going to file that in a real experience folder, as opposed to tech texting or chatting with you. So the brain differentiates between these kinds of experiences. And there are psychological studies going back into the early 1900s looking at, at 3D memory as, a, as, a, uh, as one of the linchpins for what, what, where we're hard, what we're hardwired for. So I've, where are we now? So just a quick 30-second a quick, uh, through, through history. Uh, 30 seconds through. So if you think about where we are now in 2015, uh, in 1998, uh, in 1997, there was no Google. Uh, we didn't have uh, it, LinkedIn or MySpace until 2003. We got uh, Facebook in 2004, uh, Huffington Post in 2005, uh, Twitter in 2006, BuzzFeed created by one of the Huffington Post creators also in 2006. Um, where, and, and what's, what's interesting to me is that after the, the Great Recession of 2008, not only did we see a consolidation of resources, but we've seen a consolidation of media. And I, call, I think I call the period we're in right now as sort of the peak Facebook or the peak Huffington Post period. Um, there was a fascinating article in The New Yorker recently about a, um, uh, a young uh, Entrepreneur who has created these what I would call the sort of the McDonaldization of the of the internet, where we're all basically and we were talking about this on Friday uh, before the before the gathering began about this sort of BF Skinner the sort of Skinnerization of the the behavior mod Skinnerization of the internet, which is we're all kind of rats in a in a in a in a cage tapping our, our clicking our mouses for endorphin fixes and actually I think there's a, there there's truth to that and there's truth to that throughout all of the elements that I've talked about the interest what makes video games so sticky is that you get a lot of endorphin uh, fixes from clicking that mouse and moving your avatar through and so it, in fact in the early days of the video game industry it was you were not allowed to use the word addiction because it because it was, they knew that it was addictive, and they wanted to make it more addictive. And in fact, Facebook is addictive. All of these these uh, platforms have have an addictive component to them. How many times have we have you found yourself drifting into your your iPhone and then clicking away, looking up, and five at five, ten, twenty minutes, a half an hour disappeared because you'd just gone into that space. So. Setting all that up, one of the, the beautiful things that I've heard around here is, and, and that I've seen recently, uh, I think I met Josh, the other Josh, who I don't think is here. There are three of us. Not him. <laughs> but the, uh, but uh, is, uh, there is a new movement toward, uh, toward 
creations of new forms of, uh, of, of media and, and creative content. In 1997, before we had uh, the platform Blogger, people were creating webzines. There were all sorts of terms that we were coming up with. We actually hadn't, the term blog didn't exist. The blogger was launched in 1997, but before then, there were, it was a debate whether you were a journaler or a storyteller or, or, uh, or a writer, whatever, there was, or, or a zinester. There was a great movement in San Francisco that I was a part of called the webzine. Um, and I see a new movement toward that coming. Uh, again, there was a project that, uh, so the thing that Josh and I went to in San Francisco a couple months ago was called Project Nuevo Mundo. And this is a group, uh, it's sort of a collective of digital enthusiasts who want to tell their story by creating a, uh, by, by creating a consortium. And that leads me into Bioneers. One of the things that excited me most about joining Bioneers a year and a half ago when Kenny and Nina invited me was that, uh, was that Bioneers has always been radically expansive. Kenny and Nina describe Bioneers as being sort of a coral reef of communities. They, if you think about how many people approach organizations, be it for-profit or non-profit, it's often about sticking my flag in the ground and declaring this is my, this is my turf. And that particularly translates well in, uh, in the for-profit world because you want to go and you want to win the market, but in the nonprofit world, it shouldn't be that way. I think that the, the but it, it is, and part of the reason that it is because we've had this mass consolidation of wealth in the nonprofit world, especially. Uh, we the, um, there's a, Kenny describes it as sort of a Hunger Games uh, uh, modality now, and he actually has a very interesting essay and thesis on the dramatic shift that's going on in uh, the philanthropy in the philanthropic world. But that the the Hunger Games references is, is, for example, the Knight Foundation, which has supported media in tremendous ways, is now making it all a competition. So they want everyone to to um, submit for they want to gamify uh, um, uh, nonprofits. And that causes a whole, that causes you to shift uh, your priorities uh, and causes us to have to sort of react to, to um, that shifting landscape in a different way. So um, how do we take the, so what I would offer is a challenge to those of us who are uh, from this very, the very diverse, diverse organizations. I was thinking about one of the things that Scott was saying yesterday about how, uh, in his response to Christiana's uh, presentation where he said, yeah, you know, behavior change is a good thing. Uh, I, I would hope that you would be able to change behavior more. Well, I would, I would offer, I would invite uh, organizations like uh, like the Founders Fund to actually seed disruptive change in a way uh, for, toward social good. And that means taking a risk. And the risk is that um, since most and many of the investments are going toward big money, the, the whole arc of, of investing often is, is that you're going, you want to know what the exit strategy of the business is. So you want a business that's going to collect the most eyeballs. But I think that that the ability to collect the most eyeballs, particularly in the, in the non nonprofit space, is by us staying together, at, is by us creating this coral re reef of collaboration, that we have to stand together. Now is the time to stand together. Now is the time to get uh, radically seeded, uh, ra radically disruptive, small nonprofits uh, who are doing adventurous uh, um, media work um, seeded to grow into things that can ultimately result in significant behavior change. But I think that requires us rethinking our paradigms and rethinking our perspectives um, when it comes to what it means to do social good in the for-profit space. Um, what it means, to, I think that, that there has to be more, um, more bridge building and crossover between, the, between, between us. Um, so, uh, uh, what, so, so just to in, clo in my closing remarks, I want to just summarize with a, uh, with, with a comment that is, each of us has, ta has talked about how we're, um, we're trying to bring the dream to reality. And so, uh, well, the way to get to that, I think, is, part, is taking and understanding the culture of media consumption on its, uh, on its own terms. If you look at what B BuzzFeed has done, BuzzFeed understood, uh, Jonah Peretti understood that people want, uh, they want hype, and he's starting to seed BuzzFeed now with, with what I think is an interesting bit of broccoli, they, they, if you will. They, he's, he's starting to do some, some interesting political reporting. They're starting to break some stories. But uh, that's not the whole story. And what's starting to come out in the digital media space is a hunger for uh, more media information. And we see that in the form of Medium. I think Medium is a really interesting website if you think about the, the kind of information that's being presented. It's interesting that the, found, the former founder of Blogger and Twitter went long form 
I think long form still very much has a life. If you, if you look at where the arc of where people think media is go, has been going, it's about getting your eyeballs as quickly as possible to read, to read and, and consume the smallest piece of information possible. Well, that's fine if you're just, if you're, um, if you're just feeding your endorphins. But I think that people are now more and more hungry for information. As Kenny says, we've gone from climate, we're going from climate denial to climate panic. And as that palpable uh, level of emotion starts to strike, the opportunity then is provided for organizations, communities, people like us to help change the story and the narrative around that. So that's where I'll close. Yes. Um, my question to you is uh, around pioneers and the work you guys are doing. So I spent, uh, I came over to one of your sessions mm -hmm. and there were hundreds of people in the room, uh, but I've consumed so much great content of Bioneers online where you've reached tens of thousands of people. Um, I'm curious to hear how you're thinking about the work you do and the message you're spreading through these new platforms that are developing and like is Bioneers turning into a digital media organization? I think Bioneers ha really has always been a digital media organization. It is has been a storyteller telling organization. If you talk to Kenny and Nina about what they were trying to create when they first created the organization, this topic hasn't come up, but they were they said that they really wanted to create a field. And so if you think about what they needed to do to create the field, they needed to create content. So now we have roughly 25 years of content. What's really interesting about this content uh, is that it's it still has currencies. So speeches that were given in the early 1990s. In fact, we just released a yearbook. We have some copies of us, uh, uh, co copies of with us here. It's called "Seeing Around Corners: 25 Years of Visionary Leadership." And what's really, really interesting is that they were so far ahead of the curve, 25 years often ahead of the curve, that the information that we have is now uh, still has still has currency. And so we, are, I think, we are, are a media organization. What I've been trying to do when I, since I came on board is to make sure that we adopt. Uh, 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 in a radically inclusive and radically expansive way any new platform that comes about because Binders has a really interesting challenge. We have, uh, a, we have a, uh, a generation that goes from, from 14 year olds to uh, 80 year olds or, or more and we, and we just did a, dem a demography of the people who attended the conference this year and it's like a camelback. You have, it peaks out, we have a big peak, at about, this is about uh, 3,000 people that came this year. So you see a peak at 21 and then a trough in people in their 30s and 40s, and then a, another peak in their, in their 60s and 70s. But that's, and that's, a, that's what does that mean from a, me, a digital media standpoint? The last uh, great technological shift that the 60 to 70 year olds made was switching to CDs and DVDs. And they're not going, they're not going beyond that. Whereas the 21 year olds are streaming, down, everything, uh, everything is digitized. Maybe you've got thumb drives, but it's, it's mostly, uh, you know, if they want to access content, you need to be able to access it and download it and stream it. So we have, we're, we're radically expansive in adopting uh, apps. We, we, we'd love to create a Binaries radio app. One, my, my fantasy, and one of the things we're trying to create over this year with, with scarce resources, we don't have the resources yet to do it, but is to create a 24-hour uh, Binaries internet radio program. So you'd come to the website, and we'd have a grid, because we could literally fill our, our, a 24-7 grid with all of the different topics, and say noon at every day might be uh, Binaries Indigenous Hour, where you could listen to some of these the amazing speeches. We haven't even talked about the Indigenous Knowledge Program, but, but, but uh, a, a decade ago, uh, Kenny and Nina were approached by the top Native American elders who said, we want sovereign space in, at this conference. And they gave it to them. And so there is a conference within a conference of pioneers that is the Indigenous Knowledge Conference. And this year, the, uh, an unprecedented state visit from the uh, elders of the Iroquois Nation came to Bioneers as, as the uh, U.S. ambassador to New Zealand came here yesterday and effectively presented their diplomatic credentials to Kenny and Nina on the stage. So I've digressed a little bit, but it's to say that I think we are very much a, a, a media and storytelling entity. That's how you change the narrative and, and yeah, so. Very, very illuminating stuff. Oh, thanks. Uh, really awesome. Um, one of the things that, uh, that really stood out to me because I, I work in marketing and, and um, uh, is the McDonaldization, of, it's hard to say, the McDonaldization of, of everything, really. Mm -hmm. um, but that's a great example. And just to extrapolate out from there, trending and how, how be, as we've 
um, distilled food into the most cost-effective and sugary and, and, and fat-centric uh, um, mode that it can possibly be in. Out of that, the trend, the backlash trend, is to have a resurgence into organics and have a little bit more awareness of what we're putting in our bodies. Mm -hmm. And so I see this trend that you've talked about, about just getting your fix, you know, clicking the mouse and getting your fix. And something that's occurred to me for a long time is what, what, will, what will the backlash be for that? What, where will we go because that's the way things have gone so heavily? Um, how will we produce solutions that will provide uh, slowing down and a centering and an opening uh, to counter that? Well, so the short answer is places like this and places like Bioneers. The slightly longer answer, I can tell you through the... So I, I referenced briefly the uh, MacArthur Foundation grant that I received to look at the future of philanthropy vis-a-vis -vis virtual worlds. And so remember in 2007, the uh, uh, Second Life came out, and this was a, it was the, another big bubble that people were investing in because the, those who had missed out on the dot-com bubble were like, we're not going to miss out on the, on the virtual world bubble, and it, it ended up, but what, what I got out of, what we got out of that, ex, of that project, and it resulted in a project that ultimately I presented at Bioneers in 2009 called Understanding Islam Through Virtual Worlds, and what we were doing was looking at how we could create connections between these disparate communities of Muslims and non-Muslims in the wake of September 11th, and what we found was virtual worlds or any kind of digital, our recommendations were any kind of digital action sh or, uh, or space should only ever serve as a vehicle for creating meaningful physical uh, interaction for, for our, uh, engagement. So we see, we, uh, um, we saw things like, the, the, the challenge was that in the case of, of, of Islam uh, and all of the tensions around uh, the U.S. behaviors that, that and, and, and the tensions between those two communities without getting the polemics of it, were around people couldn't come, they, they, the tensions were so high that they couldn't have person-to-person -person communication. So we needed to soften the territory, if you will, find a, an entry point in which to, to create that dialogue. But I think that the, the whole, there's a, that we're already seeing that, that shift where, where and, and, and it's, re, it's revolving around so many of these key issues about the environment. So many of these key cultural issues are, are people are realizing that we, We've, we haven't been paying attention. We've been sleeping. We've been like, as Kenny says, rock stars in the hotel room. We've completely trashed the hotel room, and uh, and and it's all ca it's caught up to us. And so, so you start to see more substantive uh, contributions. But my my frustration continues to be around uh, 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 websites like uh, Huffington Post, which I think is a is is. Uh, has been has been uh, received endless accolades for revolutionizing journalism, but in many ways it, it hasn't. In fact, they don't pay their, 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 their many of the reporters. It has become completely saturated with ads. I'm sure it's it's a financial behemoth now, which is great. You know, they, AOL bought it, but but as far as how much social good it's doing, you know, nothing. So, hi. Question for you, which you're getting very close to answering. Okay. Um, so in the U.S., traditionally, you know, media, news, et cetera, had a, a, a solid wall between it and advertising. And, um, but when you travel around the world, that doesn't exist. And so we were talking about McDonaldization. There's a value in um, promoting products that provide you with an economic means to get your message out. So in the rest of the world, when I talk to people, they know that that's what's happening. So they are able to filter it, whereas we tend to be very offended when we see those products appear in some place that we felt was trusted previously. And I'm just curious what your opinion is on whether or not that's something we just have to accept, or how do we manage this, particularly when you're a nonprofit and um, capital is, is the thing that lets you go forward. Right, so the, um, one of the first, uh, there's, a, there's a couple of interesting uh, responses in that, but I, I think that in my world, I, would, I distinguish between journalism and, uh, and entertainment. I think the ads that we see in, 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 face, in between Facebook posts are, are fair game. I think that the challenge with journalism is that there has been, um, that, that we, we're going to, journalism itself is going through a, a tremendous cultural uh, identity um, uh, shift where there, where, where, it, you look at the Brian Williams scandal, where where basically in, info the the hype and the infotainment of things have have shifted. So, so um, I think the onus of responsibility has uh, ever, 
advertise, advertising has and will continue to be one of the lifebloods of journalism and without getting into a longer discussion about nonprofit journalism versus journalism as a, as a public good and all of that, I think that the, that the, that the real challenge is that, that uh, journalism needs to get back to its roots of radical transparency with, with in terms of their um, relationship with advertising and renewing their trust in the people, but so much of it's been lost because of uh, just the mass, uh, um, it's just become infotainment, so, yeah. Yeah, thanks, Josh. I just wanted to make an additional comment, which is um, when we started Bionears in 1990, my background originally was a journalist and filmmaker. So, um, and then Nina's was in um, communications and theater, and um, so creating, uh, we'd never been to a conference before, which turned out to be an advantage, actually. We had no idea what we were doing, so we just made it up as we went along. But part of what happens is when you get, you know, the, these 3,000 people together, we do try to create an energy field, basically, the live act, and there's nothing else like that. So when that's translated into media, you know, the way we talk about it is we try to get people firing on all seven chakras. If you bring the fullness of our human experience and human endeavor to the table, it creates a whole that's great, much greater than the sum of the parts. Um, what also happened was, so we started with more conventional media, including a book series and, you know, audio and video and all of that stuff. But someone approached us um, in the year 2000 who wanted to bring the conference to Toronto. So we created a program called Beaming Bioneers, and originally what we did is we live broadcast by satellite, um, and people used the, key, the morning keynotes for each of the three days to then create their own local events. And the whole point, again, was the live act. Um, and they created, um, they used our keynotes, but then they built their own conferences with local speakers, local solutions, local issues. So over time, what that evolved into from our point of view is not ROI, return on investment, but ROE, return on engagement. And I think that's what's missing in the equation today. Digital media, I love media. I totally love media. It's a large part of what I do. And there is nothing like FaceTime, right? And Malcolm Gladwell has written about this in terms of the, you know, the so-called Twitter revolutions in Egypt or whatever. In fact, um, if you look back at the civil rights movement, it was all about shoe leather and it was all about intensely personal relationships that people held by sitting at lunch counters together. And so somehow we need to find that balance between the digital world, the virtual world, and actual return on engagement that brings people together. So that's where we're so elated to have Joshua join Bioneers now in terms of his expertise with digital media and his understanding of the political dimension of this because what we all need is social change. I think that's why we're all here in this room together. And the question becomes, how do you marry media with social change most effectively? So we're so eager to learn from all of you. Um, and I, I would say that we're at, poised at a cusp where Bioneers could have a much larger outreach for engagement, and you know that's what, one of the reasons I'm here is to learn from you all and make connections and figure out how to get this stuff out there quickly. Thank you very much, uh, Kenny, and thank you very much, Josh. Really appreciate it. So.